It's $2.50 you just put in your bowl. Um, so these are called observation worksheets. And all it is is the book of Acts. Thank you so much. Um, it's the book of Acts printed out for you double spaced. And um, at the very top, you'll see it gives you chapter theme. And you get to write in what the chapter theme is. And basically, the reason they print out the scripture is so that in your homework, it's going to tell you to color. And you may, if this is your first time, you're going to think, well, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Why do I want to color? And it really gives you a way of reading with purpose. It draws your attention to certain words or certain phrases that you probably would have totally missed had you not colored them. And you'll notice how much you're marking a particular word um, in the scripture. So that is why you do that. And you will read that in your homework. It'll tell you to do that in your homework. So um, you don't have to like know how to color the words. She'll tell you, mark this word, mark this word. And just you choose your own color. I don't always do this, but the book of Acts is so long that... Um, I went ahead and started like a little bookmark like this, um, just so I can remind myself what I'm coloring the word. So I just took, there. this is on your back cover. And so I just, um, I don't use any of her fancy coloring because I'm not creative and um, I can't draw, I don't write well. And so <laughs> um, if you do things really pretty, I, I'm all about it trying to do it kind of quickly so I just color my words and so um, if you look here I just had I wrote apostles and I'm gonna color the apostles yellow throughout the whole book of Acts I'm gonna color Peter orange through the whole book of Acts there's no right colors these are your colors but that way when I get to April or May and I try to remember what color did I say I was going to do the name of the Lord? Um, I can go back and see what I said. Now, again, she's going to tell you to color these. Um, she's going to say, go in and color Peter. Go in and um, mark the kingdom of God. And you're going to see why marking the kingdom of God is important. We're going to even see that today. So um, she's going to tell you this. So if you want to create a little bookmark like this, you can. Um, again, if it's a short book, I don't always do that, but for this book, because it is so long, it'll help serve as a reminder for me when I started colored, coloring Peter. Because we know, if you know the book facts at all, Peter's going to be a main character through much of it, but then it's, Peter's going to kind of fall off a little bit because who's going to come on the scene? Paul, uh -huh. right. And so... Um, You'll have to choose a color for Paul at that point. So um, let me share with you just a little bit about kind of the idea of this Bible study. Um, and I'll share with you that um, I got saved very late in life. I never even heard the gospel till I was um, 17 years old. And um, I heard it at a funeral, thought it was the craziest thing I'd ever heard. I mean, I, I, we weren't even close. Like, I didn't even really understand that Easter had really anything to do about Jesus. And I know that's hard to believe in our day and age. But back then, there wasn't any Christian music that I could find on the radio. No Christian TV back then. I remember there was an Amy Grant special at Christmas time. <laughs> Um, right about the time that I was thinking about Jesus, and I remember it being the first time that I'd ever noticed anything. Um, so we had a nativity scene for Christmas, but even Easter wasn't about Jesus. It was all about Easter eggs and the Easter bunny. So when I heard the gospel, um, I really walked away from the gospel, but it planted that seed that was sort of like a thorn in my shoe. It really um, bothered me that I couldn't reconcile what I had heard with everything else that I believed in life. And so it started me on that process of searching. 
and about 18 months later, not mm -hmm. quick, but 18 months later, I gave my heart and life to Christ. And when I say I didn't know John 3.16, I didn't know John 3.16. I didn't know any scriptures. And um, I had a natural distrust for people, um, and particularly men. So I really struggled trusting what the pastor said on Sundays. I wanted to know how in the world did he get that out of this scripture? And how do I know I should believe what he's saying? And so I would ask kind of my church friends these questions. I would say, you know, does he have some kind of secret knowledge? And they answered that question correctly and said, no, he doesn't have any secret knowledge. Um, he studies God's word. And I said, I want to do that. And so that kind of led to the process that 18 months after I accepted Christ, I was going to seminary. Um, I had an accounting degree, a business degree, lost parents, by the way, who were incredibly disappointed in me that I was going to seminary and turned down the internship that they felt like they had paid for by sending me to college. <laughs> so I uh, went to seminary, ended up meeting David there. But one of the things I wanted is I wanted to know how could I know God's word for myself. And I really struggled to find a class in seminary that would make that simplistic. There's systematic theology, there's Greek and all of that. But I just thought there's got to be some way for me just to read God's word and be able to understand what God wants to tell me. And um, fast forward to our very first church. Um, I took a preset Bible study and the bell went off for me. This is, I just thought, this is what I've been looking for. It was on 2 Timothy and um, 2 Timothy in particular, um, Paul uses a lot of descriptive words for God's word. He calls it a treasure. Um, he calls it a lot of different things in that book that you don't notice that that's really what that book is all about is loving, treasuring God's word. And when I saw that, it just, uh, it was just amazing to me. So, um, I, that was 30, 32 years ago now. And um, I probably taught for about 30 of those years. And so when we teach this, for the most part, you choose one book at a time. And so we just got done doing Genesis. Um, Genesis was five books long and so you just kind of keep trodden through it and you start verse one chapter one and you go all the way through it so those of you who like really fast moving Bible studies you'll have to adjust your pace a little bit I always say precept is not the microwave version it is the crock pot version um, it's a slow cook and um, and so I just um, ask you to be patient and that God will honor um, you spending time in his word. So one of the things, I'm going to go through this very quickly because it really doesn't help us a lot. But just so you know, precept is just the brand of Bible study. Um, it comes out of Chattanooga, Tennessee is where the home base of precept is. They publish these Bible studies. They're all um, written by K. Arthur. Um, who's really getting up there in age now, 80-something. Um, I'm sorry, those of you in here who are 80, um, <laughs> that I make it seem like you're old. D did I pray? <laughs> Let's pray. Maybe I wouldn't have said the 80-year-old comment. <laughs> <laughs> Father God, we... Um, we are just so thankful to be back together. God, you know that these women are a great encouragement in my life. And um, I know they're a great encouragement in each other's lives. And so we just thank you for another time together. And God, I am mindful. God, we do lift up um, Marsha right now to you, God, as she um, is just overwhelmed with um, health problems and um, and uh, problems with her husband, God, and we just love her, and we just pray for your will in her life, and um, God, I just, for those of us who are super close to her, I just pray that we would minister to her, and um, 
we just uh, thank you for her life and the joy um, that she brings whenever she walks in the room. And um, God, we just um, thank you that we have the opportunity to study your word and that you're just going to show us amazing things. And God, um, how much you've already taught me in the four or five lessons, God, of just um, what you want to do in my life and what you want to do in your church. And so, God, I just thank you for that. I thank you for the Holy Spirit that is the ultimate teacher to us all. And that every time we open your word, the Holy Spirit can use it in our lives and just um, convict us of sin, um, speak to our hearts about what we should do, God, and just encourage us and give us great power. And we just thank you for um, all that we're going to see. Um, and God, we thank you that you want to dwell with us, that your heart <clears throat> is to be in fellowship with man. And um, we just thank you for that. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So the big thing um, that Kay was on the mission field with her husband, Jack, Kay Arthur was on the mission field with her husband, Jack. God brought them back here um, because of a health issue. And she began a Bible study for teenagers. That's what precept was written for was for teenagers and some of their moms were like we want to take this Bible study too and so she started driving um, down to, to Marietta actually which if you don't know is right where we moved from so I had started doing precept years and years and years ago but then it was just crazy to move to Marietta where some women had been in her very beginning classes Roswell Street Baptist Church is where she would drive down from Chattanooga. It's about an hour drive, hour and a half drive, and she would teach these women. And so um, out of that came this Bible study. Kay, of course, blew up as a speaker. And um, Precept is just a brand of what's called inductive Bible study. And you could look up on um, Amazon um, inductive Bible study and there are other books written about inductive Bible study she didn't come up with the method she just used the method to make her Bible studies and basically what it is is that it starts with observation that's really the key difference about this Bible study is that what she's going to ask you to do normally if you're doing let's say the book of Colossians you're going to read the book of Colossians a couple times. We can't do that with the book of Acts because it's big. So she's going to be asking you to read these chapters. And as you read them, she's going to ask you to be coloring a certain word. And that is really to draw your attention to that word and all that's being said about that word, if that makes sense. And that is really the difference is this observation phase of the Bible study where you're looking for what is obvious. It's really slowing down to look at what is obvious. And we're going to look at some um, verses even today um, where it, we're just going to look at what is obvious in those verses and then ask ourselves some critical questions. It's the, I always call them the journalism questions who, what, where, when, why, and how. Um, so you're basically reading it, asking those questions. And what we normally do is we normally want to just run to God's word and say, okay, show me a little nugget of truth today. <laughs> and God always wants to show you truth. And the Holy Spirit will do that as you use this method. So observation is just looking at what's obvious, looking at the forest before you go down and look at the trees. Then we will do interpretation. And in fact, some of that is going to be um, even what you do this week. That includes cross-referencing, looking at other places that that particular word may be mentioned, and it's also looking at the Greek words. 
So looking more at what does that word mean there? And we're gonna even do that today as part of our lesson. And then of course, application happens every time. So we're gonna actually go through this. And the one thing you'll hear a lot is that context is king. It rules an interpretation. And if you back up to my story of not being able to trust um, what people were saying, um, a lot of times, and if you li listen to TV evangelists still, they will use all kinds of verses completely out of context. And it's just they're pulling one or two verses out and they're misapplying those verses. And so when you question something that you hear, go back and study it for yourself in context, looking at who is that written to, why was that written, who is the author giving that instruction to, let's say, and it really takes care of a lot of misinterpretation of God's word. Um, it never ceases to amaze me who actually gets TV time in our country. <laughs> Just crazy. So um, let's go. We're going to look at the author and the recipient right now. And this is, um, I'm at a huge disadvantage because I forgot my Bible. What Bible study teacher forgets their Bible? Thank you. So, um, and I used my phone last night, but my phone is videoing. Oh, this reminds me. Um, so, basically, the reason your schedule has Wednesday night and Thursday morning on it is that to me, you're all one Bible study. That's why when you see the list, the list is super long, is that my Thursday morning people can come to Wednesday night, my Wednesday night people can come to Thursday morning. You can flip flop however you want to do that, um, or you can join on Zoom on Thursday morning. Like if you're home with sick kids or whatever, you can do Zoom. And even if none of that works for you, we do post these videos. They're not professionally done. Um, I literally just, I don't even edit any of the video. I just take off the beginning talking and take off the end and put it on YouTube because that's all I have time to do right now. And so, um, but that's always up there for you as well. And I always email all the PowerPoints to you. So you don't ever need to print these out and if you come every time, you're like, well, why do you email them? It's because there are people who pretty much only Zoom, um, and I have some out of town people as well. So I give you the PowerPoints um, so that you can print them out yourself at home. And if you ever um, can't read a slide, or I give a map or something, and you want it in better quality, you can go and print off of what I've sent to you. Does that make sense? because sometimes the little maps are very little because I want to save paper and I do four slides on each sheet. So you always have that for you to do. All right, so what I want us to do is we're going to read just the first, I'm going to page 125 on your observation worksheets. And then um, I want us just to read the very first verse of this. Now, what is interesting about this book is that almost all conservative theologians agree that Luke wrote the book of Acts. Now, Luke is different than Paul, that Luke never actually names himself in the book of Acts. He only refers to himself as I. And it is one of the reasons we actually believe he wrote it is because he doesn't include himself in the book. He never says that Luke was with Paul. Um, and Luke was with Paul a lot. We're going to talk about that through um, some of the later. Yes? I think you might have a Thank you. Yes. Oh, no. 
Okay, we're gonna get what we can get. Thank you. If it goes off, it goes off. It says I have low battery. Must have unplugged at home. I pl anybody else charge their phone while they're sleeping? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't look at it, so it must not have charged for some reason. Thank you. I'm all out of sorts today. All right. <laughs> Thank you. You have joy. All right. So Acts chapter one, verse one. Let's just read this. It says. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. So let's just stop there. What do we know immediately from this right here? We know who the recipient is, right? And what else do we know? Just looking at this verse. Well, we've talked to him or before. Absolutely. That in fact, he says, in the first book. So what does that mean? This is the second book. Y'all with me? If I say I've written, you know, in my first letter, I wrote this to you. Well, what does that mean? I've written a letter. And so um, this is Luke's second letter to Theophilus. And in fact, he tells us, what did he do in the first letter? Thank you. See how obvious this is? He dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. And that indeed is what the gospel of Luke is all about. It's about Jesus, what he did and what he taught. And so now he is going to give us a second book. Um, and we're going to read more of that, but I want you to go with me to Luke um, chapter 1, verse 1. And by the way, they're going to ask you to do some of this in your homework, and you won't have to do it because we've already done it in class. And um, Jane has a study Bible here that I've borrowed. And so right above this, it says the method and purpose of writing. So it's this Bible is labeling these verses we're about to read as the purpose of why Luke wrote. And let's read um, his purpose of why Luke wrote his first book. He says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. So we're going to literally start at the very end of these verses, and I'm going to ask you a couple questions. Um, who is this being written to? Theophilus. Theophilus. And why does Luke say he wrote this book? To answer the questions like you have. Right. To answer the questions that he has. And he says that you can have certainty that Theophilus could have certainty concerning things, and this is important, that what? He's been taught. So what do we know is Theophilus has heard the gospel. He's heard about Jesus. And in fact, if you were coloring, um, you could back in verse, what verse is that, where it says of the word, you could even possibly color that Jesus. Um, you could say, because look at how it says, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. So what Luke is saying here gives us an indication that Luke was not an eyewitness of the things that happened with Jesus. Luke was not one of the apostles. He is 
putting together an account from those who were eyewitnesses. And he says, um, it seemed good to me having followed all things closely. The things that he's following are the stories about Jesus, are the gospel accounts. And Luke, God picked Luke, who we know later, we'll see later, is a medical doctor, probably had a very intelligent mind to document all of these accounts that he was hearing. And he wants to, I love that he says, he wants to give a very orderly account. So in Luke's writing of the gospel, we have the, the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And indeed, Luke is probably the most orderly account that we have of the gospel. Because Matthew, Mark, and John were a little more biased in why they were writing their gospels, if that makes sense. Because they all had a perspective. And we could talk about that. But each gospel, the author had a reason for why he was writing that book. And so the books are written more in that way. Luke, on the other hand, is an orderly account. Now, I love that. Um, I love that he says this is an orderly account of all that I've collected the information. So Luke made it his mission to go and collect all this information and put it together in this book of the Gospel of Luke for Theophilus. And then God, in his great wisdom, used it to put in his canonization of the scripture. It's one of the Gospels that God chose to include in there. And so we have that Luke has written that first book. And whoever Theophilus is, you can tell by the way he refers to him in Luke, he's either a ruler, someone important. And Luke wants his mission... Um, he calls him most excellent Theophilus, and he wants it to be his mission to give him an orderly account because Theophilus is deeply considering the things of God and wants to read Luke's account. And so Luke comes to this book now and he says, I've already written to you about the things that Jesus did and teach. And then look at verse 2. He goes on to say, Until the day he was taken up. Now that phrase, taken up, is what we call the ascension. And we're going to see the ascension happen in chapter 1. So Luke is going to pick up in a very orderly way of Jesus resurrected from the dead. And he... We're going to see at the very beginning of Acts in chapter 1, he's going to spend these 40 days with his disciples, with his apostles, and I'm going to call them disciples and apostles interchangeably. Um, and we'll, we're going to talk about that next week because we're going to see them choose a new apostle. Um, but they were also Jesus' disciples. So... Um, he is going to spend those 40 days, and then he's going to ascend. And then in chapter 2, we're going to see the coming of the Holy Spirit. So this is literally a historian writing for us out the beginning of the early church. And he's going to list, he's going to write out Peter's sermons for us. Um, he's going to give us great details. Um, so... Thank you, Jesus, for Luke, right? Because had we not had the book of Acts, we would have like all of these letters from Paul, right? But we wouldn't have any idea where they fit in. But Luke is going to be a traveling companion. You can see that on one of your slides, and we're not going to look each one of these verses up. You can look them up at your convenience. But in Colossians 4.14, it does tell us there that Luke is an educated doctor 
There's a precious verse in 2 Timothy 4.11 that talks that only Luke is with me. And 2 Timothy is one of Paul's last um, books that he's writing. It's very later on in his life. And you almost hear um, a sadness in him. And he talks about who had turned away from him. And he says that only Luke is with me and we'll he we see that he went from troas to philippi with paul he went from philippi to jerusalem you're we're going to see that he's there at the jerusalem council and if you don't know what that is do not worry you'll know what it is by the end um and we're going to see that he lived in jerusalem for two years while paul was in prison in caesarea and that that is probably in those two years is when Luke began gathering all the accounts that allowed him to be able to write the book of Luke and Acts. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. He literally walked around <coughs> and interviewed people <coughs> to get an account of all that went on. And it was one of his goals to write an orderly account for us of all that happened. And so we're gonna see a very orderly account of all that happened in the beginning of this early church. And you may be thinking, well, that's kind of boring to be studying a historical book. It just, you will not be bored, I promise. <laughs> it will be super exciting um, to see um, the radical change in these people. And we're gonna even talk about that for a minute um, with Peter. So let's go on, we're go back to Acts chapter one and we're gonna just look and read just a little bit more. Sarah, yes. I ask, I've always wondered, okay? Yes. Luke is a doctor. Right. Paul had some thorn. Right, right, right. Mm. And, um, other than God used him mm -hmm. to do all this, I'm wondering if God put Luke there to help Paul in a lot of this because of whatever that right. thorn. A lot of people, you know, a lot of theologians, they all agree on that. That one of the reasons Luke was his traveling companion was because he was a medical doctor. And he did, um, Luke provided that medical medical attention to Paul and oh man I'm forgetting what book it's in but it, he even says um, it may be Philippians uh, but I don't know I'm so sorry um, it says bring bring Luke to me yeah. and um, so yeah a lot so God of, used Luke in marvelous ways marvelous, I mean, ways. marvelous ways and what's interesting with Luke is we never see where he came to Christ no. we don't see any of that about him and that's why in some ways um, He's very much doesn't include himself in the story. That's why very rarely will he even say I. He's really telling you the story like he's the historian, scientific minded, telling you all the details. And um, so, yeah, I, God uses whoever we are, right, to um, accomplish his will. <laughs> And so let's look at verse, um, we'll start again in verse one. It says, in the first book, O Theophilus, and that first book would be the Gospel of Luke, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up. After he had given commands, so he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering, and that suffering would have been the crucifixion, by many proofs appearing to them, and, and we know those proofs, right? He cooked, he ate with them, Thomas put his 
finger and his wounds. So Luke is referring back to all the proofs that he had and for 40 days, just so that that length of time um, also was prophesied that the Holy Spirit is going to come and I don't want to um, preempt anything that you're going to study in lesson two, but that that 40 days isn't an accident. That 40 days was perfectly timed out of when the day of Pentecost was supposed to come. And he says for those 40 days, and this is so interesting, speaking about the kingdom of God. So what is he speaking about? The kingdom of God. Now, when we think of the kingdom of God, sometimes we think about what, you know, define what that is. Well, it's not just creation. You know, when we think of the kingdom of God, we think of creation, don't we? We think of like, this is the kingdom of God, the things he's created. But it really is God's spiritual rule, how God designed everything, this plan of salvation, his authority over his people. And so Jesus spent 40 days, 40 days speaking to them. So you think of like going on a retreat and it lasting for 40 days and Jesus being the teacher at the retreat, right? But listen to these disciples in a minute. Look at verse four. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the father which he said, you heard from me. I've already told you about this Holy Spirit. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they came together, now this just is so pitiful. When they came together, they asked him, Lord, Will you at this time restore what? The kingdom. kingdom of Israel. Now, he has just spent 40 days with them, teaching them about what? God's kingdom. And here they are after 40 days. And what are they still asking about? Israel's kingdom. What are they still worried about? The earthly kingdom. They want to know. Is the Messiah, are you going to somehow restore Israel? They're still all down here, aren't they? And God, Jesus has literally spent 40 days trying to like get them to understand the kingdom of God. And all they're still focused on after 40 days is the kingdom of Israel. Isn't that amazing? Amazingly bad, right? <laughs> Yep, amazingly human. Absolutely. And Jesus said to them, verse 7, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. The kingdom of God is not about time and seasons and all of that. Here's what you need to know, you apostles. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We're going to stop there for just a minute. Um, Y'all probably know what is verse 8 called? Great Commission. The Great Commission. That's exactly right. Because it really is Jesus commissioning all of us that when we receive the Holy Spirit, that we all are to be witnesses. In Jerusalem, in the small little places we live, like Gainesville, in Samaria, which would probably be like in the state of Florida, in... Um, I'm sorry, I forgot Judea. Judea would be like the state of Florida. Samaria would be like the United States and even to the ends of the earth. And I, I love how Jesus says the ends of the earth to people who aren't even going to come close to going to the ends of the earth. 
most of these apostles are never going to make it out of that little area. Some of them are going to go a little ways away, but they're never going to, right? N n By the way, if any cult tells you that Peter came to America, um, you know, don't believe them. But the gospel made it here. The gospel made it to the ends of the earth because all of us receive the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can be witnesses for God. So something super fun, we're going to, y'all get this one single sheet out for me that says four acts, at the top it says four acts, lesson one, verse one eight. Everybody with me? And you should have, if you didn't, it's no big deal. You don't need it yet. There's a big packet. And you may think, you sure do waste a lot of paper. And uh, <laughs> I do it because I love you. So let me tell you about in the old days. In the old days, when we did this Bible study, all of you had to have books and um which were pretty expensive and i would usually ask the library wherever we were to have a couple copies of it so that y'all could go in there and borrow it i mean we're talking a long time ago and um and and then i got to the point where it really wasn't fair so i used to make copies with the book i would open the book up on a copy machine and put it down and try to mash <laughs> that spine down do you know what i'm talking about back in the day we used to copy books and make the copy of the definitions for my precept class because you don't have all these books. And so you're like, well, what books are you talking about? So there's two books, a concordance. So the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. The New Testament is written in Greek, Greek right? And um, every single Greek and Hebrew word was assigned a number a long, long, long time ago. And it's called a concordance where every single word had a number. And that number correlated to the actual Hebrew or Greek word. Does that make sense, everyone? So every place that, let's say, the word power is used, there would be a number assigned to it. Somehow in the copying of this, I forgot to include the number of this very first word. But if you look down at the second word, do you see the number there, 3144? That is the number above witnesses. That would be the number assigned to the word witness. So if you were looking at this, every word Every place that the word witness is used, there would be 3144. And then you would go to the very back of the book and look up 3144, and you would see the Greek word in the definition. That's what we used to have to do in the old days. <laughs> now, we have great computer programs that you hover over the word, and it pulls the definition up for you miraculously it's <laughs> wonderful and you can copy and paste it so i do that for all of you i copy and paste all the definitions you're going to need and it's in the big packet of paper that you received now it's a ridiculously amount it's a ridiculous amount of information on some words like one of the words you're going to look up is baptized baptism it's in your big packet. That definition is about four or five pages long. And the reason why is that word is used so many times. And really in this definition, this should be interesting to you, um, is every place that word is used, it will be referenced in the definition. So let's just look at one. Um, the very first one's one of my favorite Greek words, and it's dunamis, and um, it's at the very top. So, um, by the way, the stuff that you don't even know that we have, the gospel, because Matthew, Mark, and John 
were a little more biased in why they were writing their gospels, if that makes sense, because they all had a perspective and we could talk about that, but each gospel, the author had a reason for why he was writing that book. And so the books are written more in that way. Luke, on the other hand, is an orderly account. Now, I love that. Um, I love that he says, this is an orderly account of all that I've collected the information. So Luke made it his mission to go and collect all this information and put it together in this book of the Gospel of Luke for Theophilus. And then God, in his great wisdom, used it to put in his canonization of the scripture. It's one of the Gospels that God chose to include in there. And so we have that Luke has written that first book. And whoever Theophilus is, you can tell by the way he refers to him in Luke, He's either a ruler, someone important. And Luke wants his mission, um, he calls him most excellent Theophilus, and he wants it to be his mission to give him an orderly account. Because Theophilus is deeply considering the things of God and wants to read Luke's account. And so Luke comes to this book now and he says, I've already written to you about the things that Jesus did and teach. And then look at verse 2. He goes on to say, until the day he was taken up. Now that phrase, taken up, is what we call the ascension. And we're going to see the ascension happen in chapter 1. So, Luke is going to pick up in a very orderly way of Jesus resurrected from the dead. And he, we're going to see at the very beginning of Acts in chapter 1, he's going to spend these 40 days with his disciples, with his apostles. And I'm going to call them disciples and apostles interchangeably. Um, and we'll, we're going to talk about that next week because we're going to see them choose a new apostle. Um, but they were also Jesus' disciples. So um, he is going to spend those 40 days, and then he's going to ascend. And then in chapter 2, we're going to see the coming of the Holy Spirit. So this is literally a historian writing for us out the beginning of the early church. And he's going to list, he's going to write out Peter's sermons for us. Um, he's going to give us great details. Um, so thank you, Jesus, for Luke, right? Because had we not had the book of Acts, we would have like <coughs> all of these letters from Paul, right? But we wouldn't have any idea where they fit in. But Luke is going to be a traveling companion. You can see that on one of your slides. And we're not going to look each one of these verses up. You can look them up at your convenience. But in Colossians 4.14, it does tell us there that Luke is an educated doctor. There's a precious verse in 2 Timothy 4.11 that talks that only Luke is with me. And 2 Timothy is one of Paul's last um, books that he's writing. It's very later on in his life. And you almost hear um, a sadness in him. And he talks about who had turned away from him. And he says that only Luke is with me. And we'll, he, we see that he went from Troas to Philippi with Paul. He went from Philippi to Jerusalem. You're, we're going to see that he's there at the Jerusalem Council. And if you don't know what that is, do not worry. You'll know what it is by the end. Um, and we're going to see that he lived in Jerusalem for two years while Paul was in prison in Caesarea. And that that is probably in those two years is when Luke began gathering all the accounts that allowed him to be able to write the book of Luke and Acts. 
Does that make sense? He literally walked around <coughs> and interviewed people to get an account of all that went on. And it was one of his goals to write an orderly account for us of all that happened. And so we're going to see a very orderly account of all that happened in the beginning of this early church. And you may be thinking, well, that's kind of boring to be studying a historical book. It just, you will not be bored, I promise. <laughs> it will be super exciting um, to see um, the radical change in these people. And we're going to even talk about that for a minute um, with Peter. So let's go on. We're going to go back to Acts chapter 1, and we're going to just look and read just a little bit more. Sarah, yes. I am, I've always wondered, okay? Yes. Luke is a doctor. Right. Paul had some thorn. Right, right, right. And um, other than God used him mm -hmm. to do all this, I'm wondering if God put Luke there to help Paul in a lot of this because of whatever that right. thorn. A lot of people, you know, a lot of theologians, they all agree on that, that one of the reasons Luke was his traveling companion was because he was a medical doctor. And he did, um, Luke provided that medical, that medical attention to Paul. And, oh man, I'm forgetting what book it's in, but he even says, um, uh, but I don't know. I'm so sorry. Um, it says, bring, bring Luke to me. Yeah. And um, so, yeah. Well, so God used Luke in marvelous ways. Marvelous, I mean, ways. marvelous ways. And what's interesting with Luke is we never see where he came to Christ. No. We don't see any of that about him. And that's why, in some ways, um, he's very much doesn't include himself in the story. That's why... Very rarely will he even say I. He's really telling you the story like he's the historian, scientific-minded, telling you all the details. And um, so, yeah, and God uses whoever we are, right, to um, accomplish his will. And so let's look at verse. Um, we'll start again in verse 1. It says... In the first book, O Theophilus, in that first book would be the Gospel of Luke, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up. After he had given commands, so he was taken up. After he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles, whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering, and that suffering would have been the crucifixion, by many proofs, appearing to them, and, and we know those proofs, right? He cooked, he ate with them, Thomas put his finger in his wounds, so Luke is referring back to all the proofs that he had and for 40 days, just so that that length of time um, also was prophesied that the Holy Spirit is going to come. And I don't want to um, preempt anything that you're going to study in lesson two, but that that 40 days isn't an accident. That 40 days was perfectly timed out of when the day of Pentecost was supposed to come. And he says, for those 40 days, and this is so interesting, speaking about the kingdom of God. So what is he speaking about? The kingdom of God. Now, when we think of the kingdom of God, sometimes we think about what, you know, define what that is. Well, it's not just creation. You know, when we think of the kingdom of God, we think of creation, don't we? We think of like, this is the kingdom of God, the things he's created. But it really is God's spiritual rule, how God designed everything. This plan of salvation 
his authority over his people. And so Jesus spent 40 days, 40 days speaking to them. So you think of like going on a retreat and it lasting for 40 days and Jesus being the teacher at the retreat, right? But listen to these disciples in a minute. Look at verse four. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. I've already told you about this Holy Spirit. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they came together, now this just is so pitiful. When they came together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore what? The kingdom of Israel. Now he has just spent 40 days with them teaching them about what? God's kingdom. And here they are after 40 days. And what are they still asking about? Israel's kingdom. What are they still worried about? The earthly kingdom. They want to know, is the Messiah, are you going to somehow restore Israel? They're still all down here, aren't they? And God, Jesus has literally spent 40 days trying to like get them to understand the kingdom of God. And all they're still focused on after 40 days is the kingdom of Israel. Isn't that amazing? Amazingly bad, right? Yeah. Amazingly human. Yeah, amazingly human. Absolutely. And Jesus said to them, verse 7, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. The kingdom of God is not about time and seasons and all of that. Here's what you need to know, you apostles. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We're going to stop there for just a minute. Um, Y'all probably know, what is verse 8 called? The Great Commission. That's exactly right. Because it really is Jesus commissioning all of us that when we receive the Holy Spirit, that we all are to be witnesses. In Jerusalem, in the small little places we live, like Gainesville, in Samaria, which would probably be like in the state of Florida, in, um, I'm sorry, I forgot Judea. Judea would be like the state of war. Samaria would be like the United States and even to the ends of the earth. And I, I love how Jesus says the ends of the earth to people who aren't even going to come close to going to the ends of the earth. Most of these apostles are never going to make it out of that little area. Some of them are going to go a little ways away, but they're never going to, right? N by the way, if any cult tells you that Peter came to America, um, you know, don't believe them. But the gospel made it here. The gospel made it to the ends of the earth because all of us receive the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can be witnesses for God. So something super fun. We're going to, y'all get this one single sheet out for me. It says four acts. At the top it says four acts, lesson one, verse one eight. Ready with me? And you should have, if you didn't, it's no big deal. You don't need it yet. There's a big packet. And you may think, you sure do waste a lot of paper. And uh, I do it because I love you. So let me tell you about in the old days. In the old days, when we did this Bible study, all of you had to have books. 
and um, which were pretty expensive. And I would usually ask the library wherever we were to have a couple copies of it so that y'all could go in there and borrow it. I mean, we're talking a long time ago. And, um, and, and then I got to the point where it really wasn't fair. So I used to make copies with the book. I would open the book up on a copy machine and put it down and try to mash that spine down. Do you know what I'm talking about? Back in the day, we used to copy books and make the copy of the definitions for my precept class because you don't have all these books. And so you're like, well, what books are you talking about? So there's two books, a concordance. So the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. The New Testament is written in Greek, right? And um, every single Greek and Hebrew word was assigned a number a long, long, long time ago. And it's called a concordance where every single word had a number. And that number correlated to the actual Hebrew or Greek word. Does that make sense, everyone? So every place that, let's say, the word power is used, there would be a number assigned to it. Somehow in the copying of this, I forgot to include the number of this very first word. But if you look down at the second word, do you see the number there, 3144? That is the number above witnesses. That would be the number assigned to the word witness. So if you were looking at this, every word, every place that the word witness is used, there would be 3144. And then you would go to the very back of the book and look up 3144, and you would see the Greek word in the definition. That's what we used to have to do in the old days. <laughs> now, we have great computer programs that you hover over the word and it pulls the definition up for you. Miraculously. <laughs> it's wonderful. And you can copy and paste it. So I do that for all of you. I copy and paste all the definitions you're gonna need and it's in the big packet of paper that you received. Now, it's a ridiculously amount, it's a ridiculous amount of information on some words. Like one of the words you're gonna look up is baptized, baptism. It's in your big packet. That definition is about four or five pages long. And the reason why is that word is used so many times. And really in this definition, this should be interesting to you. Um, is every place that word is used, it will be referenced in the <laughs> definition. So let's just look at one. Um, the very first one is one of my favorite Greek words, and it's dunamis, and um, it's at the very top. So, um, by the way, the stuff that you don't even know what is, what that is. Does everybody have one of these in front of them? Because I think Mary came in with some. And if you didn't get your packet, don't worry about it. You just need this right now. Okay. So you see there, that's the actual Greek that uh, very few people can actually read that. And then dunamis is what's the English type of word, transliteration of the word that at least we can try to say. Um, and then it tells you where the word came from. It's um, from Deutemai, which is 1410. And the word means to be able. Power, especially achieving power. All the words derived from the stem Duna have the meaning of being able and capable. It may even mean to will. It's contrasted with this other Greek word, which addresses the factuality of the ability, not necessarily the accomplishment. Mm -hmm. Now that should be a little interesting to you, mm -hmm. that dunamis is about the accomplishment of the power, instead of just 
the capacity of the power. So here, here's what I mean by that, is you may say, that girl has a powerful voice. If she never uses that voice to sing, it's really, whatever that word is, isis, iscus. But if she actually accomplishes the, the power to sing, it becomes duna, dunamai. And by the way, this is where we get the word dynamite, dynamic, all of those die words. Um, well, not the word die, but dynamite, <laughs> dynamic, all of those we get from this word. And it speaks of intrinsic power. Now, what does intrinsic mean? Well, it's interior. It's not exterior, right? It's something that's interior. So let's think about dynamite. Dynamite is intrinsically powerful, right? If I was to lay some dynamite here, right? Nothing that on the external makes that powerful. What's in it makes it powerful. Isn't that interesting that sometimes we think if Jesus was just here with me, everything would be okay. If I just felt like he was right here with me, but the best Jesus could ever do right here with you is give you extrinsic power. The Holy Spirit living in you gives you intrinsic power. It comes from the inside out. Jesus being here would be comforting externally. But the Holy Spirit living in us changes everything inside out. And so the best that Jesus could have done with his disciples in telling them about the kingdom of God for 40 days, after 40 days they were still asking, what about the kingdom of Israel? And yet, we're going to see a radical change when that Holy Spirit comes. And Peter is going to go from being one way to radically being a different way because of the power, the dynamite ability of the Holy Spirit. Think about that. Think about the Holy Spirit being like a stick of dynamite that can change everything. And, you know, sometimes David and I, we will just chuckle because we'll see somebody come to Christ. And, um, and my Stephen has a friend, and we were even talking about this. And um, he said, he's sharing Christ with his friend. And he said, don't judge him. He said, sometimes I feel guilty because if he was to accept Christ, it would blow his whole world up. And he said, he knows that too, and that's why he holds Jesus shoulder length away. Because it will blow up his world. And I thought, yes, Junimus, it will. The Holy Spirit will blow it up. And I remember the um, girl who was discipling me, um, I had just a precious girl named Deborah who witnessed to me, witnessed to me, witnessed to me. And when I finally came to Christ, she said, I'm going to disciple you. I didn't even know what that meant. And she said, we're going to meet for lunch once a week, which that's an intense um, <laughs> discipleship. And she was so faithful. And we did back in the day how to have a happy life or something by some Campus Crusade book. You may remember that old book. And... Um, and I would say, well, I just don't think that. I, you know, sort of like the kingdom of Israel. I just don't agree with you on that. I just don't agree. And she'd say, okay, well, that's fine. You don't have to agree with me. 
you know, you have the Holy Spirit, and I'm just going to let God deal with you. Well, I learned to hate that phrase. <laughs> because within a couple weeks of her saying that, sure enough, the Holy Spirit would convict me, and I would think very differently than I had thought. Now, it didn't happen overnight all the time. But through the process of the Holy Spirit working in my life, it changed everything. It blew up my life. And we're going to see this is how the disciples went from cowering in a room, scared, to these incredible spokespeople, witnesses of the gospel. And we're going to look at that in Peter's life in just a minute. But I want to look at one other word. This was fascinating. I had no idea this word was this. But the word witnesses there in verse 8, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, is, comes from the word martis, maturius, which is where we get the English word martyr. Isn't that interesting? And um, Rochelle and I were talking about this at the beginning, um, that you know many of us have read that book, Fox's Book of Martyrs, or we've at least heard about it. And it's really this um, book of all these incredible Christian martyrs who were put to death because of what they believed. So think about that, that really that book could be called Fox's Book of Witnesses. They were just witnesses unto death, where that is usually not what's required of us and won't probably be what's required of any of us. But we're the same. We have the same Holy Spirit. When you read that book and you wonder how they did what they did, we have that same Holy Spirit that we are to be witnesses and the word means a witness, obviously. One who has information or knowledge of something, and hence, one who can give information, bring to light, or confirm something. And so you can see there, Matthew 18, 16, everybody with me? Those are all the places that that word is used in that way. It denotes that the witness confirms something, though in many cases that witness may have been bribed or otherwise persuaded to make a false statement. <laughs> You're going to read in Acts 6.13 where somebody gives a false witness. And it says, in the sense of a simple confirmation, um, and it goes on to include things there. And then look at the second paragraph peculiar to the New Testament is the designation of maturist witnesses of those who announce the facts of the gospel and tell its tidings. And it goes on to list where that's used. Also, maturist is used as a designation for those who have suffered death in consequence of confessing Christ, which the example of that is Stephen. Um, and so we'll continue to look at that word as we continue on. But let's look at it fleshed out. That Jesus says to his apostles that you're going to receive this dunamis, this intrinsic power that's going to come upon you, that you're going to be my witnesses. So let's look at Acts chapter 2, and one of the things she's going to have you color is Peter. We're going to look at Acts chapter 2, and um, I don't want to preempt anything for you, but the Holy Spirit comes in those verses before, and we're going to start looking in verse 14. So what I want you to get is that in verse 9, we're going to start seeing that there are lots of people here. There are Carthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, 
lots and lots of visitors from Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretans, Arabians, because here they are, they're in Jerusalem, and all of these people are all together, and you're going to see why when we look at chapter 2, why they're all together. But here they are all together, and um, the Holy Spirit has come on, they're speaking in tongues, and some of them are even saying, these guys are drunk. They're filled with new wine, right? In verse 13, what's wrong with that? Why are they talking the way they're talking? And then Peter, standing with the 11, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell right now here in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. And then he is going to start in verse 15, and he is going to preach a sermon all the way to verse 36. And what we're going to realize, and in fact, look at verse 38, Peter is going to say to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then look at the very end of 41. What's the result of that? 3,000 souls responded to his message. So what does that tell you, obviously, about who he was speaking to? It was more than 3,000. Right? Peter stood up among thousands of people and presented this sermon and then tells them to repent and be baptized and that they would receive the Holy Spirit. And you may say, so what? That's, of course that's what Peter did. But let me ask you, who was Peter 41, 42 days ago? Fisherman, a coward, denying Christ. Think about what a short period of time 41 days is, right? That in 41 days, even when Jesus was there teaching him, Peter was still, like the rest of the apostles, worried about the kingdom of Israel. And if you don't know the story, Peter was a coward. A little slave girl came up to him, and he said he didn't know who Jesus was. That he wasn't with Jesus when a slave girl asked him. And then, 41 days, 40, whatever, however you do that math, Jesus was with them for four days. So I guess it's 43 days from the denial, right? Three days for the resurrection. Um, here we are. And Peter's standing up preaching before thousands of people. And what caused that change? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit caused that change. And we're going to see the Holy Spirit. And I, I want some of these stories are so familiar to you. But I want you to really think about the Holy Spirit being like a stick of dynamite. Blowing up the world of Jerusalem. And that is why you're going to read all the leaders are all worried about this. Because when you blow up something in Jerusalem, it's going to cause other people to notice. And they're going to notice something radical is happening in their city. Um, and we're going to see how... The Holy Spirit is going to blow up Jerusalem, then it's going to blow up Judea, and we're just going to continue to see that in the book of Acts. That works. And by the way, many people think that it's called Acts because it's the Acts of the Apostles, but it's really the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. That's why it's called Acts. It's the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the the apostles and so we are just gonna love 
as we study this, watching the Holy Spirit do his work. And that that's why Jesus says, you know what, Peter? If I stay here with you, you will still be worried about the kingdom of Israel, and you may still deny me to a slave girl. But if I leave you, I only give good gifts. And if I leave you, you're going to get the gift of the Holy Spirit, and it's going to completely change who you are. And the really good news is, ladies, when we come to Christ, that is the gift that we receive. Just like now the, now the apostles got the Holy Spirit later on after following Jesus, because that's how God planned for it, and Peter even explains that. But if you look at the 3,000 people, they received the gift of the Holy Spirit on that day. And, and verse 42 begins to describe for us what changed in their lives. And at the point of salvation, we receive that dynamite, that dunamis. And our problem is, is that we usually have tried to, you know, keep that all contained. And not allowing that intrinsic work to do what it wants to do in our lives. And so I just... It's been just super encouraging to me that I have seen so many places in my own life that I do not rest upon the work of the Holy Spirit in my life. You know, one of our values um, here at, at Westside is we say prayer over might. Prayer over might. And another way of saying that would be Holy Spirit over might. Trying to do in our own flesh what God wants to do using the Holy Spirit. So it'll be so encouraging to you. And when you read Peter's sermon, when we get to Acts chapter 2 and you're reading through that sermon, just shake your head and think, man, what a work the Holy Spirit has done in that man's life. And here he is, just this many days later, able to stand before thousands of people and So we're going to end there today. We probably have done about half of your homework this week. Um, she tells you to look these words up. We've already looked them up. We've already talked about them. So you can maybe reflect on something you remember about it. Um, so you'll have a lot less homework. I, um, I always tell people that um, our best intentions when we start a Bible study is to answer every question and do it all perfectly. And that rarely happens for all of us. Rarely happens for any of us. No one will be checking your book to see how much of your homework you've done. That is, that is all up to you. And sometimes you'll have good weeks, sometimes you'll have bad weeks. Um, but just do not worry about it. Just come back, get filled back up on Thursday mornings, and start back off again. And no one's going to look at your book to see that you have left open things. And you know what? You always have the intention of going back and finishing it, right? Don't do that. Don't go back. Just stay and keep walking with us as we walk through this book of Acts because you're going to be blessed. And I will tell you, I have to remember this all the time. And by the way, I, I am not living what I'm preaching. I mean, I am living what I'm preaching. Is right now, I am in the thick of night to shine. And that's all right now that's just permeating my mind all the time, thinking through all the details I have to take care of. And I decided that God was going to get the first fruits of my labor. And I have, don't even look at my email. I won't even take your call. I won't even take your text message. I'm spending those first efforts with God in his word. And, and I'm doing that really because if I've never done this book before, and if I don't do that, then I won't have anything to share with you. So I am doing it out of necessity. But God has been richly blessing that. 
And so I just challenge you to try to give God the first fruits of your efforts, whatever that is, whether it's at 9 o'clock at night, 6 o'clock in the morning, sitting in a carpool lane, whatever it is. Just if you exercise, you can put the book of Acts and listen to it, you know, whatever, however you do it in your life, just give God the first fruits and he'll bless them. Let me pray for us. God, we thank you that what we are powerless to accomplish in our lives, that you are all powerful when you live in us. And God, as we think about all of our inabilities, um, we may be shy, we may not have influence, we may be this, we may be that. God, I thank you that your Holy Spirit basically changes um, our nature, takes us from a cowering man, afraid of a slave girl, to being able to stand before thousands of people and share. And God, I just thank you for that. I thank you that that dunamis that changed Peter is the same power that lives in each one of us, that we have received that same Holy Spirit, and he has not changed through the thousands of years. He is the same. And he is not diluted down. He is the same Holy Spirit that is going to change and radically blow up Jerusalem. And so, in the best way. And so, God, we just um, ask that you would let us see a glimpse of that in our own lives and that you would um, use us to be your witnesses, God. And we would just give you the honor.